We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Good morning. I love this church. Thank you for inviting me. It's the highlight of my year. I love your pastor, and I get to travel to Guatemala and Cuba with him. He, uh, he, I, he said he wasn't going to tell my age. I said, I'm not a woman. I'm 69, but I'm a young 69. You know, you're as old as you feel, and I'm a, I'm a young 69. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere today. I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, yeah, the uh, doctors removed a five-pound tumor from off my heart and lungs and said, go home, you're not going to survive. 18 surgeries and surgical procedures, a year and a half of chemotherapy and radiation, complications near death's door. Here I am, signed, sealed, delivered. Uh, aren't you glad doctors are sometimes wrong? Yeah, I am too. I, I brought to two of my books uh, to give you as my gift. That's because my son says no one would pay money for them. I think I told you this, but he said, Dad, I saw your book on eBay. It was a quarter. He said, and it was autographed. He said, how embarrassing. So I have my book on defining moments. It's stories of what God is doing around the world. And then my newest book, Your Love on the Front Lines, Resisting ISIS and Evil. Very timely. And let me say, while I believe it is our government's responsibility to protect its citizens, as followers of Jesus Christ, it is our responsibility to love refugees. We've been commanded to love refugees. And let me tell you this. The vast, vast majorities of the refugees we're helping don't want to come to America. Many of them carry their keys on a key ring to a home that is no longer there, that's been bombed out as a symbol that hopefully they can go back home someday. And many, many of the refugees we're working with are our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And so this short book, little booklet on ISIS and evil and the refugee crisis, it's very timely this morning. It's my gift to you. Please read it. It will show us what a biblical response for us in, in this uh, crazy, crazy time we're, we're living in as, as believers, what our response is to refugees. Regalo gratis suyo. Those are three words that changed my life forever. I realize that that phrase is overused, but in this case, it's accurate. I just graduated from high school. I was 17 years old. My uncle invited me on my very first missions trip to Mexico where we were going to distribute Bibles and build a church building. And I remember in the mornings, we would work on construction and building this modest building that would seat 300 people. And in the afternoons, we would take boxes of red Spanish New Testaments and go door to door and distribu distribute them in the slums. And, and I remember the streets were filthy, dirty, with open sewage running down it and children running around, little babies without clothes on. And as a 17-year-old boy, petrified, I would walk up to the door. And, uh, many times they were just shacks and shanties, and I would knock on the door and someone would come to the door, and I couldn't speak Spanish. I only knew three words, regalo gratis suyo, which is broken Spanish for free gift you. And so imagine this 17-year-old boy, they come to the door, and I say, free gift you. And I hand them this red New Testament. In fact, this is actually one that I brought back 50 years ago. And it's one of my most prized possessions from my very first missions trip. It's all dog-eared. And I remember many times those mothers and grandmothers would take, take the Bible and they would thumb through it. And when they realized what it was they were holding, they would hold it like this and they would kiss it several times. Sometimes they even grabbed me and hugged me and kissed me. Uh, they were so appreciative and so grateful. And at the end of the week, we finished the building and had a dedication service. And I saw hundreds of these villagers come very proudly bringing their Red New Testament. And the gospel was preached. And I saw them come to Christ and make decisions to become followers of Jesus Christ. And at the young age of 17, I realized several things. Number one, how many people had never held a copy of the Bible, let alone owned one? Number two, how precious the Word of God was and how much I took it for granted. And number three, how important it is to have a place of worship, a church of their own. And I don't think it's any coincidence that now, many years later, I'm still traveling around the world facilitating the construction of modest church buildings. Uh, your pastor and I have done that in several countries now. Buildings where no churches exist, and distributing free gifts to people who have never even held a Bible, let alone owned one. So little did I know, as a 17-year-old boy, that God was preparing me for what he wanted me to do with the rest of my life. I thought it was just going to be a fun youth missions trip to Mexico, but God used it to change the direction of my life. Catalyst, a Roman poet said, It is difficult to lay aside a confirmed passion. And although the methods and strategies have changed over the years, I've never been able to lay aside the passion that God is giving me for reaching the world with the gospel. A few months ago, I was in Iraq. 
And my partner said, uh, we, we were just a few miles from Mosul. We could see the fire and the bombings. My partner says there's a village of Christians who had to flee Mosul with just the clothes on their back where uh, World Help is giving them food and clothes and medicine and blankets and heaters. And he said, but they don't have Bibles. They had to leave them at home. They left so quickly. He said, would you like to go with me and distribute some Bibles to this village? I said, I would love to. So we got out there and they backed the pickup truck up and they opened up the first box and I'm walking up to the first door and they hand me this red Arabic Bible. Well, immediately, in my mind, raced back 50 years ago when I held my first red Bible in my hand. And I walked up to the gate and knocked, and this Iraqi Christian grandmother came, and I stuck it out. I almost said, regalo gratis suyo, <laughs> but I said, no, she speaks Arabic. And so I asked my partner to say in Arabic, would you tell her three words for me? He said, sure, regalo gratis suyo, and I mean, free gift for you. And he said that in Arabic, and I handed it to her. She thumbed through it. And when she realized what it was, she held it like this, and she began to kiss it. And I was a mess. Fifty years ago, I handed out my first red Bible. Several months ago, I handed out my latest red Bible. And in between, I've distributed 10 million red Bibles around the world. So I would say that that day on that dusty road in that village in Mexico, it was a defining moment in my life. In Mark chapter 12, the passage we call the Great Commandment, notice what Jesus said about passion. One day a man walked up to Jesus and said, what's the most important commandment out of the whole Bible? What's the one thing I need to get down if I don't get all the others down? And Jesus summarized the entire Bible in two sentences in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30 when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. You can just feel and hear the passion in these verses. Jesus says there are only two things that really matter in life. Love God and love other people. That's what matters most. But he said we can't love people and God in a half-hearted way. We have to do it passionately with all of our heart. I, I love this verse translated from the message translation. It says this, love the Lord your God with all your passion, all your prayer, all your intelligence, all your energy. And if we want to be followers of Jesus Christ, we've got to live with passion because he deserves everything we have. He says no matter what we do, do it passionately. 
No matter what we do, do it with all your heart. Never do anything half-heartedly. If we're going to do it, it's worth doing passionately. If we're going to do it, it's worth being all in. C.S. Lewis once said, the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. The casual Christian is a contradiction in terms. We are either passionate about loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, or we're not. But why is it that many times we're not more passionate about loving God? Could it be because we don't know him very well? The more we love God, the more we're going to fall in love with him. The better we understand what he's done for us, the more passionate we're going to be about loving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Today, we're often passionate about everything except God. There are going to be a lot of people today passionate about football. And then the rest are going to be passionate about commercials. <laughs> Some of my friends are passionate about hunting. And they will spend hours freezing in some little box in top of a tree waiting for a deer to come by. And they'll spray deer urine all over them. <laughs> That's passion. <laughs> Some people are passionate about movies, clothes, cars, the home and garden channel. My wife, all she watches is home and garden. I called DirecTV and said, how much is it if I just get one channel? <laughs> She's even got me hit. It, it, she's even got me hooked on Chip and Joanna. <laughs> I even know what shiplap is. <laughs> the amazing thing in our culture today is that it's okay. It's even appropriate to be passionate about anything as long as it's not God or Christianity or Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to do it with passion, with all your heart. Let me just quickly give you three thoughts about passion. Number one, God gave us our feelings. It's okay. We were born with a God-given sense of passion. We are wired that way. He has given us emotions. He created us to be able to feel all that happens in the world. It's okay to cry. What happened to us? Where did our zest go? What happened to our enthusiasm for life? Why don't we still feel the same way about our careers that we used to? Why don't we still feel the same enthusiasm about our marriages that we used to? Why aren't we as close to God as we used to be? What happened? Second thought, living without purpose is often the reason we lack passion. I like what Emmett Smith said uh, on ESPN. I, I did get to switch over for a few minutes this week. He says, a dream is a dream until you write it down, and then it becomes a goal. Without purpose for living, why bother? Why put out the effort? Why get out of bed in the morning? If you have no reason for using energy, why expend it? It becomes an attitude of been there, done that. The fact is... Life seems pretty useless if you don't know your purpose. The longer we go through life without clarifying God's purpose for our life, the less passion we will have. Passion and purpose go together. And without purpose, life is passionless, and there's no reason for enthusiasm over the long haul. At times, 
We may feel like Isaiah who said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Have you ever felt like that? I know I have. Many times I say, why am I doing this? An unclear purpose will kill passion in our lives. On the other hand, a clear purpose creates passion. The greater our purpose in life, the more passionate we're going to be about living, the more fully alive we're going to be. There's nothing more significant than being what God made us to be, doing what God made us to do, thinking like God made us to think, sharing in the greatest cause in the world, the advancement of his kingdom. There is no greater purpose. And it should create the greatest amount of passion in our lives. My purpose in life is this. Mainly, maybe because I'm a cancer survivor. I don't know. Probably. Maybe it's because I'm a grandfather of six boys. One of them has a birthday today. I I don't know, probably. Maybe because I don't have that many more years left. Maybe, probably. But my passion and my purpose is this. Every day, I try to live my life in such a way that I accomplish at least one thing that will outlive me and last for eternity. Third thing I want to tell you about passion is God has given each of us certain gifts, abilities, and talents, and all for a certain purpose, his purpose. Passion is waking up in the morning wherever you are, however old or young, and bounding out of bed because you know there's something out there that you love to do, that you believe in that you're good at, something that's bigger than you are and you can hardly wait to get at it again. It's something you'd rather be doing more than anything else in the whole world. You wouldn't give it up for money. It means more to you than money and hopefully it's something that makes the world a better place for other people and not just yourself. That's passion. That's exactly what the point is doing in Guatemala and Cuba. You have literally, with your passion, transformed a village in Guatemala that's not even the same. Your pastor is passionate about reaching Cuba with the gospel. Every time we talk on the phone, every time we see each other, this morning sitting down here for just a few minutes on the front row before the service began, that's all we talk about. He's passionate about it. Your church, this church is passionate about developing a strategy to go into a village in Cuba and provide food for the hungry and medicine for the sick and homes for the homeless and Bibles for those who've never heard of Jesus and a church that proclaims the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in your DNA. You are passionate about it. You're committed to going several times a year I'm excited that on your next trip, I, I get to tag along with you. It's going to cost me, though, because I was supposed to have lunch with Gabe, but I got to get home to my grandson's birthday party. And so I told him I'd make it up to him in Cuba. I'd take him out for lobster in Cuba. <laughs> That's going to be expensive. But you go several times a year, year after year, passionately being the hands and feet of heart of Jesus on the ground and making a difference and making an impact and 
bringing total transformation in the name of Jesus Christ. I commend you, point, for your passion. I encourage you in your journey. You're making a difference. You're making an impact. Thank you for what you're doing. In his book, Don't Waste Your Life, John Piper shares a powerful example in a contrast of a life with passion and purpose and a life without it. He said, in April 2000, Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards were killed in Cameroon, West Africa. Ruby was over 80, single all her life. She poured it out for one great thing, to make Jesus Christ known among the unreached, the poor and the sick. Laura was a widow, a medical doctor, pushing 80 years old herself and serving at Ruby's side in Cameroon. The brakes failed, the car went over a cliff, and they were both killed instantly. He said, I asked my congregation, was that a tragedy? Two lives driven by one great passion, namely to be spent in unheralded service to the perishing poor for the glory of Jesus Christ. Even two decades after most of their American counterparts had retired or throw away their lives on trifles. No, that's not tragedy. That's glory. These lives were not wasted. And these lives were not lost. He went on to say, I'll tell you what tragedy is. I'll show you how to waste your life. He said, consider a story from Reader's Digest, which tells about a couple who took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. At first, when I read it, I thought it was a joke, a spoof on the American dream. But it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life. Your one and only precious God-given life. And let the last great work of your life before you give an account to your creator be this. Playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them before Christ at the great day of judgment. Look, Lord. See my shells? That's tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. Over against that, I put my protest. Don't buy it. Don't waste your life. And I add to that, don't lose your passion. Before I came up here to speak, I wrote at the top of my notes one word, passion, and I underlined it because I do that every time I speak. You say, why? Because it doesn't matter what I say. What matters is how I say it. Is it passion? Or is it just words? Be passionate about the things of God. God hasn't moved. He's just waiting us for us. To love him with all of our heart, mind, 
soul and strength. And I encourage you, leave this place and go do something today that will outlive you and last for eternity. God bless you guys. I love this church. I love you. Thank you.